As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke in 1968 in Memphis on behalf of his Poor People's Campaign, he reminded America that black children and families lived on an island of poverty in a country that was seen as a sea of abundance. Peter Edelman already knew that. In 1967, he and Robert F. Kennedy had traveled to Mississippi to examine firsthand the issue of poverty. What Peter Edelman and Senator Kennedy found was children, thousands of them, hungry to a point very near starvation. It was there that Bobby Kennedy understood the need for moral imagination among those whose privilege and power influenced our national policy. Had Robert Kennedy and his friend Dr. Martin Luther King lived, I believe we would be living in a different country. But in April of 1968, we lost Dr. King, and in June of 1968, we lost Bobby. And my last year of law school was filled with both hope and fear. But it was our good fortune as a nation that Peter Edelman was with Bobby in the Mississippi Delta. Because what was revealed to these two men and to Marion Wright Edelman, Marion Wright who would become Marion Wright Edelman, was something that became Peter Edelman's voice and his life's work. Before he wrote So Rich, So Poor, he wrote a book called Searching for America's Heart. Never has the title of a book been more meaningful, because in many countries, poverty can be an everlasting diminishment of the human condition. But in America, it can be overcome by our will to end it. In 1968, Dr. King was in Memphis to support the protests of the city's sanitation workers for safer equipment and to an end to unlivable wages. He died supporting that cause. And in 2012, Mary Kay Henry, president of the Service Employees International Union, called Peter Edelman's book, So Rich, So Poor, an insightful exploration of the tragic condition of poverty and income equality, inequality. But beyond that, Barbara Ehrenreich simply asks us to read this book because the issue of poverty affects every person in this room and every aspect of social justice. Robert F. Kennedy's dream for America's children and families lives on because of the man who is with us tonight. It is one of the proudest and happiest moments of my life that I introduce you to the man who continues to give us the moral resolve and the insight to overcome poverty in America, Peter Edelman. Thank you, Bob. I don't think I've ever been introduced as beautifully. Thank you, thank you. And it's so wonderful to see all of you here at Stetson School of Law. <laughs> right. Uh, so I got the whole Stetson treatment uh, all the way across Florida. Uh, there was uh, Bob's former students who had a plane that helped that happen today, in case you didn't know how. But it was actually very easy. You could go over there all the time. Just ask those guys for their plane. Of course, it'll take you longer to get to the St. Petersburg Airport to fly over there. Well, anyway, we, we, don't, have to, we don't have to go there. Um, I, I'm happy enough to be here, very happy, but I'm even happier to be out of Washington. <laughs> oh. So it's maybe a little better today than it was yesterday. Um, anyway, we don't have to talk about that unless you want to. Uh, our, what is happening is, is disgraceful, it's shameful. Uh, it's, it is uh, horrible for millions of people in our country who 
have been hurt uh, by the shut shutting down of our government for no good reason. Um, and by the threat that we would, would actually default on our debts and become um, an embarrassment in the eyes of the other nations of the world. Uh, I've been learning a little about your wonderful law school and, and uh, uh, the commitment to advocacy and especially from my point of view, the commitment that you have to the issues that I want to talk about tonight, uh, the issues uh, about low-income people in our country, and, and uh, I know that there is a commitment and a, and a strong tradition of pro bono here at the law school, of, of uh, people who go into, in addition to private practice doing uh, many things, uh, uh, go into uh, being public defenders, go into be, being legal services lawyers, all of that. Uh, and so what I want to talk about is really to step back uh, and look at the bigger picture of, from a lawyer's point of view, why it is uh, that we have to have uh, so many people defending people who are accused of crime who can't uh, afford a lawyer. Um, not, we don't always live up to the to the mandate of Gideon, as we should in this country, but I think we would all agree that we shouldn't have so many people uh, even put into the dock for the crimes they're accused of, and, and similarly on the civil side. So uh, what is the bigger picture of inequality uh, and poverty in our country that uh, results in the need uh, for legal representation? Um, among other things, if we could reduce poverty, we would reduce that burden of responsibility uh, as lawyers. So, uh, next year is going to be 50 years since we enacted what we called the War on Poverty. Um, we should be ready for an onslaught of public officials, uh, commentators, uh, people who will say, as indeed President Reagan once did, that we fought a war on poverty and poverty won. And you'll hear longer versions of that. Um, and so when you, you Look at the numbers, 46 million people who in our country are poor. Um, just on the face of it, there's some temptation to wonder about whether President Reagan actually had a point. So we need to understand uh, some facts for our own selves, but uh, also in the context of this public discussion that's going to take place, uh, because the fact is uh, that we have done a lot. Uh, we, have, we have certainly here have heard without even going into this 50th anniversary year that somehow what we've done, Congressman Paul Ryan has said this, many others have said this, did not work, did not work. Otherwise, why would we have 46 million people uh, who are poor? Um, I, I just had an email this afternoon from uh, a friend who's an advocate in, in uh, Vermont. Uh, some people call it the Socialist Republic of Vermont. Uh, and it has a Democratic governor uh, who uh, proposed to his legislature to cut their state earned income tax credit. Um, by two-thirds, saying that it did not work. When you have, that, that's almost, uh, it's, it's hard to compute, right? A Democratic governor in a liberal state saying that the earned income tax credit does not work. 
So we're, we're in a framework here where we need to, to, to understand what does and does not work uh, and, and do a far better job of talking to uh, Americans about what works and what doesn't. The fact is that uh, starting when we started to measure poverty, uh, the first year for which we have numbers uh, is uh, 1959. Over the ensuing 14 years, we cut poverty in half in this country from 22% down to 11%. Uh, African-American poverty in that period of time was cut from 55% down to 31%. We were doing things uh, that work, and there are a combination of reasons for that. Uh, some, some of it's public policy, some of it's the very hot economy of the uh, major part of the 1960s, uh, some of it is a result of the civil rights movement. Uh, but we did things that have made a major difference. We passed Medicaid. And look at the, what's happened to infant mortality uh, in our country. It's gone way down, uh, especially among low-income families. Um, we still have a crisis of, of affordable housing, but the, the, the condition of housing in this country has improved uh, tremendously. So we've done things that work, and, and uh, of course, very importantly, uh, in 1967, we found, as Bob said, uh, horrible hunger in our country, and not just in Mississippi, but then, uh, having once seen it, we began to look elsewhere and found uh, in eastern Kentucky, found in South Carolina, other places. And the Senate took it up and did hearings around the country that, that in the middle of our prosperous country there was third world uh, hunger and we enacted a food stamp program which with all of the issues that we have about poverty has alle alleviated that extreme hunger that we had. You don't see that anymore. You don't see, as we did in Mississippi in 1967, uh, children with swollen bellies and with sores on their arms and legs uh, that won't heal. Food stamps are an enormous success. But you know, you read, you see on television the attack uh, that the people receiving food stamps are uh, just people who don't want to go look for a job. Need I say, a, a non-existing job. Uh, so we've done a lot, and, and the, the, the programs and policies, including the Earned Income Tax Credit for uh, anybody who doesn't know, is adds uh, money to the wage of someone with children uh, who's already working. It's not for people who have, have no work, but um, it takes a, a minimum wage job at $15,000 uh, with, uh, if you have two children, and there's another thing called the child tax credit. You add all that together and it increases uh, those families' incomes by about 50%. Uh, between Social Security and Earned Income Tax Credit and food stamps and a, a number of other things, uh, instead of 46 million people who were poor, we would have 86 million people who were poor. That's the point about uh, the 46 million. It's, it's, it's far too many people, but we have public policies that actually are keeping it from being far higher. So the question is, the logical question to ask then is, okay, uh, if the person believes that, but uh, whether they do or don't, why are there 46 million people who are poor? Uh, in our country. So I'd like to just walk through, uh, if we situate ourselves back in 1968, uh, with those things that I said having happened, those, those uh, goals, that, that, those gains that we had made uh, during that decade, which are very impressive. What happened? Uh, 
fact is that, that th there's a quite a long list of things that have happened over the ensuing 45 years, besides the fact that it's 45 years this summer that I got married. Uh, that was a good thing, and it's been a good thing all the way through. Uh, and I want you to call my wife. The, uh, <laughs> a lot of things that happened that weren't so good. Uh, that we did not foresee. Number one, we've turned into a low-wage nation. That is more important than any other single thing uh, in the analysis and the understanding of why we still have so much p poverty, and not only poverty, but people with uh, incomes above the poverty line who just uh, quite obviously have incomes that don't allow them to pay all their bills every month. Um, so we know why. Uh, Globalization, if we're going to say it simply, uh, technology that, that destroyed a lot of jobs, uh, what happened to unions, um, the fact that the minimum wage didn't keep up, uh, quite a long list uh, of things. But what I think we don't understand in terms of our kind of everyday uh, discussion in carrying on our business is just how um, huge this problem is. There are 106 million people uh, in this country uh, who have incomes below twice the poverty line. That's below $38,000 for a family of, of three. It's a third of our people have incomes that are that, are that low. Um, half the jobs in the country pay less than $34,000 dollars if you have that job full time in, in all year, half the jobs. So uh, people who could send back then as, as, the, as the flood of low wage began, it was really quite palpable in the, in the 70s, uh, where there were two parents in the home, they could send mom uh, if she wasn't working out to work and do sort of okay. But then a second thing happened, which, which we all know, but we haven't sort of thought through the economic consequences of it, is that family structure changed in this country and, and that we have large, much larger numbers of, of uh, women with children who are uh, trying to uh, earn enough money to support those children. And uh, it's just really, really hard. Uh, on those low-wage jobs. A quarter of the jobs pay less than the poverty line for a family of four. So when we're looking at statistics, you know, we have 15% poverty uh, in the country right now. That's way too high. Uh, African-American, Latino, uh, Native American poverty, 26, 27%. Mothers with children, mothers with children, 42% of single moms with children, 42%. So you have this, this coming together of, of the flood of low-wage work, especially uh, with families where you have uh, a single parent, a single mom struggling with it. Um, and the people who are in that fix are stuck. Whether it's a single mom, whether it's uh, a, a family with two people out there working, those jobs have only increased, the wage has only increased over this 40 year period by 7%, a grand total of 7%, when you take inflation into account, a grand total of 7%, in other words, a fifth of a percent a year on the average. So that's, that's uh, issue number one uh, that, that we absolutely have to deal with. The first thing is we've got to give it a name. We've got to, we've got to talk about it. We've got to, we, we, people know it in their daily lives, and, and I think that there are people who uh, think it's their own fault. That they think that it's their failure, it's something they did wrong, it's some, some way in which they were inadequate that leaves them in this fix. 
Well, in fact, it's a, it's a structural thing that's happened uh, in our economy. Um, and um, it, it's, it's just not something that they did. It's, it's a market failure uh, of our labor market. Not simple to, not simple to uh, figure out what we would do. Raise the minimum wage, get you part of, of the way there, do somewhat more with the earned income tax credit. Uh, things that we should be doing properly as a country that actually would have the effect of, of uh, raising incomes. Uh, that is to say, suppose we had a um, really significant investment in child care as a country. Uh, now, President Obama actually made a proposal uh, which has been completely eclipsed by the current political situation. But if we were to do that and, and get investment at the state and local level, uh, we would be doing something about the kind of supports that especially single moms need to, to uh, be able to go to work. Uh, but we would also be creating jobs for people who work in, in the child care. And that becomes uh, meeting a national need and, and um, at the same time, creating jobs. And, and so this, this kind of thing, if we, and we need to do that right if we're going to do it, because uh, I know some of you know these numbers. The average child care worker in this country makes $17,000. Uh, it's a job that pays, on the average, less than the poverty line for a family of three. Um, but nonetheless, I throw that out there as an idea. We should have a strategy to create the housing that we need uh, for low-income people, which, which, by the way, if, if we invested in that, would lower uh, the cost of housing for people because we have a dearth of supply of affordable housing. And if we did that, there would be jobs in creating that housing, and we would actually lower the cost of living for low-income people who are struggling. Um, I would mention health care, except guess what? We did that, if we can keep it. Uh, but what is going to happen in terms of our concerns that uh, we uh, all ought to have about what is the job picture going to be like throughout this century, how do we get out of this low-wage uh, trap, um, we've done it on, on health care. And, and, uh, so it's not only right for the, the, the intrinsic improvement in, in people's uh, health situation and their ability to uh, afford health care, it's actually going to create some jobs. So it's just uh, kind of a thought to throw out there. We talk about infrastructure. That's right. We need to invest in infrastructure. That would create jobs. But it's the bottom line of what I'm saying here is we need a national debate on the division between the role of the public sector and the role of the private sector. That's a very big idea. Uh, you can just hear what people will, some people would say about that. Because to do all these things I'm talking about costs money. We have to, we'd have to raise the revenue. Uh, we should do that in a fair way. It means that we would ask the people at the top and the corporations to, to pay more and we'd close those uh, loopholes. Um, but we need that conversation. It's not massive increase in public payrolls. These are, these are things where the people who actually do them are in communities they work for nonprofits. Um, and the, the, the public financing allows that to happen. And indeed, I would just add another point uh, here, which is, is uh, these things can't be done well. And it's kind of one of the reasons why I sort of love getting out of Washington. If we're going to have a system of child care for, and it's so important, you know, the, all the science says, and more science every day about how vitally important it is that that kids get developmental child care and that they're ready for school, uh, totally ready for school 
at age, at, at age five. Um, if we're going to make that happen in a community, if we're going to make our schools work properly in every community, if we're going to create the pathways into the labor market for young people who are falling by the wayside now and uh, becoming uh, uh, numbers uh, in, the, in the, the mounting toll of the cradle to prison uh, pipeline, the heart of it, the financing may come from national government, some from state government. The heart of it is the, the civic commitment of people uh, in, in communities uh, across the country. And so when we talk about what we need to do about poverty, uh, it, it's all hands on deck, as they say. Uh, it's, it's government at all levels. It's, it's all kinds of private action, all kinds of civic commitment. It's personal responsibility uh, as well uh, on all counts. No young person is going to make it through whatever pathway ha they we offer to them unless they take responsibility for themselves. Um, parents, obviously, uh, enormous personal responsibility. On the other end, because I started this, I threw in a few other things there, but um, low-wage nation, 106 million people. Um, wages just stuck, haven't grown. And by the way, the economy didn't stick. The economy didn't not grow. During that whole period of time when the entire half only had that 7% gain, the people at the very top are doing very well. Don't have to tell you. Uh, just one, one added uh, fact to, to sort of uh, summarize all the others. From, and many of you know this, 2011 to 2013, the top 1% gained 21% in their income, 21%. The entire rest of the population gained 0.4%. And you better believe that most of that 0.4% was in the top 20%. Uh, people further down got nowhere or actually lost ground. Well, now I want to talk about the other end. Um, because, again, sort of quietly, I, mean, I, I think that our realization of just how deep our situation as a low-wage uh, nation has become has sort of snuck up on us um, in, 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 in its, its uh, really gross entirety. We've only become, uh, and not enough of us have become aware of it. Well, at the bottom, uh, people who earn um, half or have incomes at half the poverty line or less, in other words, below $9,500 for a family of three, 20.6 million people now, 6.7%. And even when you take into account, uh, we have a sort of crazy way of counting our poverty statistics of, of the number of people in poverty, and so the earned income tax credit and food stamps are act, not actually counted in income for purposes of poverty. Even if you take that into account uh, for the lowest income people, it's 15 million people. So that tells you that food stamps and, and earned income tax credits, got to let Governor Shumlin in Vermont know this, um, that they are working to lower the number of people in deep poverty, but still 15 million people. And it's twice the percent that were in that situation in 1976. So what is that about? Uh, all the way along, there are always a certain number of single individuals who, who uh, are, are not doing well, and they're just kind of, some of them are homeless and, and, and so on. But the real part of the increase, it's women and children. So you've had women and children who are uh, the, the worst recipients of the problems that come from low-wage work, and, and here they are at the bottom. Well, why? 
In 1996, uh, our country enacted uh, the uh, Personal Responsibility Act, the creation of uh, the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. In other words, most of you know, the program that replaced uh, aid-dependent children, the aid to families with dependent children, the, the, the cash assistance program that we had. And it was one that needed to be changed. Um, it really didn't help people find jobs. That's why there were 14 million people who were on welfare when President Clinton took office, because it was too easy to just sit there and not uh, make an effort. Too many people got into that habit. But what was done was, um, well, I don't know, I suppose somebody, people thought it was shock treatment. But in any case, they took away the, the uh, legal right to get help. So once they did that, they could throw people off, not let people uh, on. Um, I'm talking the states when I say they, and the number of people uh, on uh, TANF went down from 14 million nationally to about 4 million where it is today. And P.S., uh, during uh, the, the recession, uh, which I trust we all agree still goes on for millions of people in this country. Uh, food stamps went up from 26 million to 48 million people because there's the legal right to get it. And uh, welfare in the middle of a recession when people are really, really, really hurting went from 3.9 million to 4.4 million people and in many states actually went down. And so you go from uh, a, a program which, as I say, was, was flawed in lots of ways, but 68% six, of children living in poor families were getting the cash assistance that we call welfare. That's now down to 27% nationally. Half the states, fewer than 20% of children living in poor families are getting cash assistance. Six million people are getting food stamps and no, have no other income. Six million people. A third of the poverty line, $6,000 for a family of three. Because in so many states, you, you, you can't get cash assistance. So all you can get is food stamps. Wyoming, may surprise you, is the winner of this bad contest. 600 people in the entire state of Wyoming. 4% of children living in poor families in Wyoming. Perfectly legal. So that's what's happened, and that translates into this tremendous increase in the number of people in this incredibly wealthy country who are living at, on incomes of less than half the poverty line. We didn't foresee that either. Now that's not something that happened uh, structurally. That's not something that happened about the economy or about, about family structure. Uh, that's public policy. That's just tearing a gaping hole uh, in the safety net. And they're still out there, you know this, they're still out there in Congress and elsewhere talking about all the people who are on welfare. It's a sick joke. What welfare are they on? So those of who may have noticed that there's nobody on welfare, they've started saying that food stamps is the new welfare and, and we better do something about that. So all those 48 million people just sitting around, having a good time eating their food stamps, it, it's, uh, that's what's going on. We didn't expect that the education system, uh, our public education system, would uh, fall on the kind of bad times that it has. I'm talking particularly, obviously, in inner cities, a lot in rural areas. Uh, and so I won't say a lot about that. We're making a lot of efforts uh, as a country and, and uh, with a great deal of argument about what's the best policy in a variety of ways. Uh, but one thing I would say about the agenda for the, for the public education system, I implied it before, is that uh, we're just doing a really bad job in creating pathways into the labor force for young people who are going to 
who live in, in low-income neighborhoods and are going to schools that are really not connecting them, not preparing them and not connecting them for the jobs of the 21st century. But along with healthcare, we do have other jobs coming along uh, in, in uh, areas of uh, computers and technology and so on. And, and uh, there are a series of uh, the uh, kind of middle skill jobs, my friend Harry Holzer calls them, but you can't get those jobs unless you not only have a high school degree, you have to have some post-secondary education. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, even a two-year degree. It can be a certificate for many, many of these occupations, and they pay quite well. Um, but if, if, a, if a young person is in a high school uh, that is not connecting him or her to the, the possibility of opportunity and hope, and is not delivering a message and skills along with, with this uh, message that they, there's true possibility for them to go somewhere in life. If that's not being conveyed, um, there's a whole message on the street that says, what are you bothering about? Why do you go there? And the truancy goes up and they drop out of school. I remember I interviewed uh, for, for my book, uh, uh, Searching for American, America's Heart, uh, a group of young people in Baltimore, and a young man told me that he quit school and he kept getting uh, notices, uh, not about why was he being truant, but as though he was still in school. They didn't even know he was gone. So, uh, the, the, the one thing I would say about education is that there is, we do know how to do this. You know, a lot of us have in our minds vocational education, that's the dumping ground. It's, 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 it's uh, operatively racist, right? That was true, and it's still true some places, but we have now career academies that are in 2,000 schools in this country that, uh, a lot of them are in the suburbs, by the way, uh, where people are happy to have those programs. Uh, and and uh, we're just kind of, in a national way, asleep at the switch. President Obama did make a proposal, as many of you know, for a race to the top in his, uh, a new race to the top in his State of the Union this year uh, on this very subject. So um, there is understanding in his administration about that. We didn't foresee what happened to the criminal justice system and the, and, and the so-called drug war. Uh, and so uh, all of the issues uh, about living uh, in an inner city and so on, everything that goes with that, uh, all the issues that have when you have concentrated poverty and, and uh, bad things happen in sort of the uh, inner relationship of, of too much poverty in one place. And then comes along uh, from the outside the, this, um, Arresting everybody in sight, um, 2.3 million people, uh, you know, you all know this. And so we need to face up to that both on the side of, of the criminal, I'm not going to say criminal justice, the law enforcement system, um, and specifically also within that uh, issues about our drug policy. So. Two more things um, that I think we did not foresee. I mean, to think about it, in 1968, we had problems in, in inner cities, right? Lots of man child in the promised land, a lot of you read that. Uh, I certainly was very aware of it working for Robert Kennedy. It wasn't as though the, the idea of concentrated po poverty was, uh, although we didn't use that terminology, uh, was a brand new thing, but it was severely exacerbated by the combination of of the globalization that hit everybody uh, and what happened to those inner city neighborhoods where you had had the civil unrest, you got the Fair Housing uh, Act of 1968, it became possible for people uh, to, to, who were now in the middle class because of what happened in the 1960s, if they wanted to get out, uh, they could get out and go live in the suburbs. And, uh, indeed, we read now that, that the largest increase in, in uh, uh, concentrated poverty, uh, census tracts with over 40% poverty, is now taking place in the suburbs. 
but in any case, going back to, um, to 1968, we didn't foresee that there would be this tremendous uh, increase in all of the problems that are associated uh, with the inner city. And I think that's our great, in, in a list of things that we haven't done well or didn't respond to, my own view is our uh, lack of response to concentrated poverty or sufficient response to concentrated poverty in, in inner cities is the worst thing, my thought. Um, so, there, it's, it's tough now. Um, there's a new book out called Stuck in Place by a man named Patrick Sharkey that, it'll just depress you, but anyway, it's a really, really important uh, book on, on this subject. Um, and along with that, the thing, the next thing that I think we did not expect is I think we thought that with all the progress we made on race in this country, and it has been, I don't have to list those things for you, we know, we still have a, a, a terrible politics of race, uh, and along with that gender. Uh, I mean, I've talked about women and, and children in two respects. And of course, children are the, are the poorest age group in our country, passed up the elderly, actually a long time ago, 40 years ago, became the, the poorest age group uh, in the country. And so I think we did not expect that we would have this continuing uh, racial part of the politics, really nasty racial part of the, of the politics on poverty. Uh, you know, we all understand that uh, if you want to know who's I hope we all understand that you want to know who is poor in this country. There are more white people who are poor than there are black or, or brown. Um, but you go out on the street and, and uh, person after person will tell you otherwise. Um, and if we, if we did things, I think this is sort of something that needs to be in the dialogue, like uh, raising the minimum wage or raising the earned income tax credit or, or uh, getting better health care for every long list of things uh, where everybody benefits, but actually, so that's good for uh, whites, and it's disproportionately good for African Americans and Latinos because they're disproportionately poor. Anyway, we have that politics, and finally, of course, I know, and you do too, that we did not expect to see this, this uh, increasing disparity uh, between the top and the bottom. Uh, and we're seeing, although not doing, but we've got a little bit of, uh, when President Obama got reelected and we had our last settlement, temporary settlement of these problems, we got a little, tax increase, not even all the way back to what it was before George W. Bush, but uh, all right. So we had um, Occupy, and they didn't get a lot done. Um, I don't know if they were about getting something done, but they got it in our thinking, yeah. Um, they got it in our thinking. And so there's been a focus, some, if you haven't seen Bob Reich's uh, movie uh, that's just come out in the former Secretary of Labor uh, uh, called Inequality for All, uh, find it somehow uh, and, and take a look. Uh, I'm flattering Bob here, but it's, it's really the Al Gore, it's really the inconvenient truth uh, about inequality. But it's about inequality. And what happens is it's all this important stuff about how the top 1% is running away with everything, right? All the growth between uh, the early 70s, you know, when the bottom people got stuck, it all went to the top, literally, arithmetically, mathematically. Um, when they talk about the 99%, I always have this feeling that somehow that doesn't go all the way down to the bottom of the 99%. You know, it's, re it's really tough on the 98s, folks. Uh, 
So we need to have a conversation because about that, not just a conversation, action about that, because the fact is that that power that's accreting, and I don't need to tell you, is changing our country. Citizens United and all the rest of it, the Koch brothers and all the rest of it. But I also want to tell you that if we're going to attack inequality, you attack it at both ends. You attack it at both ends. And that's the other part that needs to get onto the front burner, onto the table uh, in a serious way. So uh, we all know that what we're seeing going on in Washington right now is, is connected to all of that. Uh, the, the gerrymandering is a gift from the Koch brothers uh, and others like them. And we, 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 it's a tremendous challenge to us and to the young people here especially uh, to make it part of our business in whatever way we can uh, to change that politics because we won't get these things done that I'm saying. We can do some wonderful things uh, in our communities for people to help other people in a civic way. Volunteerism is actually a part of the answer. Uh, it's true, but we won't get the public policy that we absolutely have to have unless we have a politics that makes it happen. And so that's part of the challenge uh, to the law students. Now, you, you need to go out and, and be lawyers and do your pro bono or your full-time work as legal services lawyers. Uh, or public defenders or whatever it might be and when you're, when you're thinking about that work, thinking about if, if somebody comes into your office and they have X uh, problem about public benefits, you know, what are the recurring problems and how can you work on the structural changes that will change those policies for people, all of that, but also what do you do as a citizen? What, what do you do as a person in our society? Uh, with a responsibility uh, to uh, make this a, a better country in the sense of, of making our promise of democracy uh, be kept. So I think if we're about justice, justice should be a word for all of us in law schools. I was very interested over at your other campus. What a wonderful group of students over there. I don't know how much you all get over there, but, but uh, it's dedicated. The place is dedicated to social justice. Wow. How many campuses are like that uh, in, our, in our country? And they are telling their students one way or another in so many of their classes, number one, you have to serve, but number two, service is different from justice. And you need to see the connections from doing things one-on-one, -on -one, which are vitally important and can be a wonderful career, being a legal services lawyer or a public defender, case by case, and that adds up to a career. But even more so, to see the structural problems that are ca causing this unending parade of people who come into your office needing help, that's about justice, changing that. That's about structural change. We need to do that. So I always uh, end in the same way because I think that um, the quote that I want to share with you from Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel really do, does sum up everything I've said. He was Dr. King's friend, as many of you know. Uh, he was a refugee from Nazi Germany. He came to this country and uh, was in various uh, seminaries, uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary, the conservative Jews. They all didn't like him very well because he was somebody who made them uncomfortable. He was a truth teller. And one thing that he said, which I think applies to absolutely every one of us and we should remember it and we should act on it every day, and that is, we are not all guilty, but we are all responsible. Thank you for the chance to be with you.
Professor Edelman has done four teach-ins today. This is his fifth. And what he likes the most is the same as all of the faculty who are here tonight, and that is being with you and hearing your questions. And uh, he even took questions off point all day today. He just, the energy of anything students want to ask uh, is why he came here. So uh, the floor is open for questions. couple different things to think about. One is, are you looking for a full-time career that relates to this, or are you thinking about, well, I, I practice law in whatever way, and, but I am a member of the community, and I, I do have a pro bono uh, obligation. So just uh, answer it both ways, or maybe you can help me. Yes. Well, uh, so you're in private practice, uh, and, you know, it's, without sort of going through a whole lengthy list, it's spending some of your time, uh, A, spending some of your time representing individual people who can't afford a lawyer. You know, you look at the legal services uh, system, if that's even an applicable world, word uh, in our country, uh, and uh, we're serving um, about 20% of the need. This is on the civil side. A lot of studies show this. Um, in Washington, we, we probably have the most, I think, the most full-time uh, civil uh, lawyers on the civil side, legal services lawyers uh, of anybody around the country. And uh, it's, it's, we, Probably the pro bono effort that lawyers make, whether it's helping somebody not be evicted or helping somebody get public benefits that they were denied or helping with a family law uh, problem or a housing, uh, you know, mortgage kind of issue, all different kinds of things. I think that's probably something on the order of two-thirds of the hours that are spent in our city helping people. It's pro bono. Uh, it's an absolutely essential part of, of our legal services picture. So just doing that would be a tremendous contribution. Uh, but then the, the second piece is the same as what I said a few minutes ago, which is even as a part-time pro bono lawyer, finding ways to get involved in, in um, policy questions and getting legislation passed uh, at the state level, the county level, the city level, whatever it is, or helping to get things done uh, in some way. Somebody wants to do uh, low-income housing development and they need some legal help on the transaction, uh, things like that. Uh, we are in Washington starting, uh, I chair the Access to Justice Commission uh, in Washington, and we're starting a major pro bono uh, partnership with our full-time providers on the question of housing. And uh, we're in the process of designing that right now, but it's, it goes everywhere from trying to accomplish civil Gideon, in other words, a right to a lawyer in landlord-tenant court for every tenant, uh, and also a guaranteed lawyer if somebody's housing voucher is threatened uh, or if they're denied uh, shelter. But that's just the tip of the iceberg of what we're doing. We're looking at what, how can we involve uh, particularly the lawyers in private practice in strategies to uh, increase the supply of affordable housing. Can we put together uh, an effort that uh, becomes a political effort to get more money into our local housing trust uh, fund, for example? Uh, can we create some kind of a project uh, that pushes our uh, local uh, 
DCFA, anyway, it's the local housing agency, about code enforcement, about mold, about lead poisoning. Uh, because it's quite clear that they're not doing the job that they should be doing. And so we're going through, and we've, we've had hours of meetings so far just cataloging, uh, putting down on, on a couple sheets of paper all of the housing-related issues, and now we're prioritizing, and then we're going to take that prioritizing. I mean, the, the legal service community is working on this, but we're going to take it more broadly there and to some law firms and say, which of these pieces would you take on, maybe in collaboration with other law firms? So uh, these are, this, this systemically creates some places where individual people can find a niche to work. But, so that's my, my answer, and, and it sounds like that's what you were asking about. Uh, pro bono should be very sophisticated. It should be very systematized. I mean, it's great when individual people take on cases, although uh, a lot of times you have to connect to the full-time provider to, to make sure you don't commit malpractice when you go in representing somebody if you haven't done it before. But there's tremendous important possibilities for people whose, whose day job is in some, some other aspect of the law. completely sure, so uh, tell me if I'm not helping uh, respond to your, in, in my response. Um, I think that lots of people in this country uh, think of, of poverty in racial terms. Uh, they're just sort of oblivious to the, the fact that there, there's a lot of white poverty. Uh, and that in turn, that's one of the factors that makes them less responsive about doing something constructive about poverty. So what I was saying is uh, maybe it would help if they knew, this is, it's not a majority. Uh, it's about 44% of the poor in this country are white. Uh, and the 56% the, the is, that's non-Hispanic white. The 56% is sort of divided uh, between African American and Latino, uh, with a, you know some Native American, some Asian, and, and so on. Uh, so all I'm saying is, is uh, as one among a number of things that we might point out to people, uh, that that if they think this is solely a question somehow of race, they're just wrong. That's what I was trying to say. Is that helpful? Okay. Okay. Yes. can tell you uh, what, where I think we ought to be. I mean, our basic organization is a free market system uh, that is tempered by regulation. 
Some people think too much regulation. Some people think not enough regulation. We've always had a mixed system. And uh, in terms, uh, I, I've not particularly thought about it in, in, in where I would even use the word socialism, which I, I think was the word you were using. Uh, but it's also true, if you want to look at, that, at it that way, that uh, we uh, regard ourselves as having a responsibility for the government to play a role in, in a variety of, of uh, ways to uh, help our population. Um, and so we're far from a, a, a complete laissez-faire uh, free market system. We never have been, uh, and certainly not since Franklin Roosevelt. So how do you uh, talk about Social Security, about old age benefits for people? That's a public program. Um, and if you like, it's not the way I would talk about it, but you can say that's, a, that's a one among many, many things that shows that, that, that our capitalist system is not a pure free market system. So we're already doing what I think you're asking for, that is we're already mixing elements of the free market with elements of a government role. Um, and the argument, except for a very few extreme people, uh, more on the right than on the left, the argument isn't really about whether you're going to have a pure free market or, or some sort of pure socialism. The argument is what's the mix of what we do have? between, uh, as to the role of government. So I hope that's helpful. might uh, take a look uh, just, just to sort of underscore a longer version of the answer. Michael Katz, the uh, University of Pennsylvania historian, has just come out with a new edition of his book, The, the Undeserving Poor. So you get the long version of the uh, answer there, although uh, it's probably more descriptive than it is analytical. Uh, because it's certainly true that, that uh, from biblical times, We've had uh, a concept, it's something in somehow apparently in our human nature to uh, think about deserving and undeserving poor. Uh, and and uh, in fact, uh, with all of the concerns that we have, remember I said at the beginning that we've done a lot about these, these uh, issues. The question of who's deserving in our country has been uh, one where we've been moving the, the, the ball or, or moving the goalposts, whatever you want to say. Um, so that the elderly are kind of our first uh, deserving poor. I mean, if you go back to the 19th century, it was more on the basis of uh, who was poor and who was a pauper. If you were a pauper, uh, you were just useless and cast away because you were a drunkard or whatever it was. Uh, but in the 20th century, the first really uh, cohesive group that became behaving was the elderly. And then we added the disabled uh, first in 1954 with, with the Social Security disability benefits, and then in 1973 with uh, Supplemental Security uh, Insurance, SSI, and then uh, the Americans with Disabled Disability Act in, in uh, 1987, 89, anyway, whenever, in the late 80s. So, uh, you know, all of these things we have more to do. Under Bill Clinton, although the earned income tax credit was uh, there uh, actually in small measure since the mid-70s, Senator Russell Long of Louisiana, um, I think that it's fair to say that with Bill Clinton, 
Uh, we added the working poor in a significant way uh, as deserving. No, I mean, I just spent half my speech talking about low wage work, but uh, the, the fact is that if you look at the rhetoric of politicians, they always talk in kind of sympathetic terms of the, of the working poor. And I gave you those numbers that at least if you have kids in a minimum wage job, you, you have a tax benefit that, that adds 50% to your, to your income. And what, what has happened with that is that those are all very good things uh, about which we should feel good. But we've isolated the, the group of non-disabled, and that's a kind of, not a bright line, but non-disabled adults between the age of 18 to 65. Um, and they are essentially the undeserving poor. Unfortunately, they have kids who are the victims of that because we like, we say we like kids. They just have these parents that we don't like. Um, even on that, in the middle of, of TANF, which is, a, you might have guessed, I think is a, is a terrible public policy, guess what? In the, in the Affordable Care Act, we just put 18 to 65-year-old non-disabled adults on the Medicaid. You know, and then the Supreme Court went and said, it. well, it's just up to the states to do that, and so you all have a job that I know you're working on to convince your legislature to take it in Florida, but actually putting it in terms of your question, um, that's a small, I mean, not so small in and of itself, but in, in terms of the public uh, uh, impression of these things, that, that's uh, finally a kind of a invasion of the air of, of b being undeserving for those 18 to 65 year old people. So that's a little frame for you in thinking about it. I didn't really answer your question about why we don't have a narrative. And I guess I would answer the question by saying we've snuck up on it. We didn't talk about uh, the elderly uh, in poverty terms. We talked about the elderly as elderly, disabled as disabled. Well, yes, working poor, but working, et cetera. So that there's, there's actually is a question about messaging or an answer about messaging in what I said. Yes. It's uh, poisonous if you bring it up. Talking about Washington, it won't do so well in Tallahassee either. Um, so uh, it's a challenge. It really goes back to your question about the narrative about the un uh, undeserving. The, uh, w w the one of the reasons why you have this attack on food stamps now. Uh, is because it's the last thing that we have that's uh, income for people at the very bottom, right? And, you know, never mind that it's also a, a wage supplement for people who are working, you know, it plays various roles depending on your in, income level. Uh, or, you know, you're temporarily unemployed, although it's getting a little old how, how long you've been unemployed, at least you're getting food stamps. Uh, but they're really zeroing in uh, in their mind on the fact that, that uh, there are all these slackers. And I think, again, what they have in mind uh, is a much smaller group of people. So to get, uh, I hate to say this, but to, to get a, a really thoughtful, sensible uh, kind of safety net at the very bottom, uh, we don't, we're not even on, at the moment on square one. So I'd like to give you a better answer, but that's my honest answer of where we are. I mean, I can tell you policy. That's not what you're asking me, though. I can tell you how I would design a, a cash assistance uh, system that would be good. I mean, Europeans uh, routinely have family allowances or children's allowances, and, and uh, we're the only uh, industrialized country that, that doesn't have a, a whole sort of carefully designed and sculpted set of things for uh, people who are in various uh, levels of income and uh, 
how much work and so on that they have. Uh, we put these things in these kind of, well, we'll do food stamps here, we'll do SSI there, whatever it is. Um, and by the way, there, there is a mounting attack on SSI also, uh, especially the children's SSI, if, if you've been following that. So uh, our effort, the, the narrative question, and just in general, our effort now uh, politically uh, is to save the things that we have. So uh, I'd love to be talking about a, a sensible, first of all, I wouldn't call it TANF, but that's a different. Um, uh, right now, we've got to save food stamps. You know, it's under, it's under attack right now as we sit here. So, yes. Um, first, I'd like to thank Chester for making this open to the public. Um, I uh, work in an agency, and St. Pete did uh, with the poor, and I've been doing that for 33 years, so everything you're saying is right on, right on point, Terry, and um, the welfare reform, the Clinton, I just, I cried, and cried, and the five-year limit, and it's not been raised since then. A single person with one child book is $211 to live on. Um, my question is kind of uh, similar in some ways, but... For a second, before you ask your question, $211 for a mom and one child... In Florida. In Florida. Right, plus food so stamps that... Yeah, plus food stamps. Plus food stamps. The, the, um, there was always bipartisan support from the very beginning of food stamps, and, and that was connected to the fact that there was support from the farmers as well as the, the food processing industry and, and the retail food uh, industry. Um, and uh, the farmers have sort of fallen away from it because uh, they're in such great jeopardy about the thing they care about most, which is the direct subsidies they get, which are in deep political trouble. So they've sort of fallen away. Uh, and I think it turns out that the political help that was there from the food processors and the uh, retail grocery stores was not as powerful politically as the farmers themselves. In other words, I think you'll find that uh, those interests that you point to are still trying to be helpful, but they, they just don't, they don't carry it anymore. 
Uh, you know, as late as 2002, President George W. Bush uh, was a great supporter of food stamps. Um, had a had an undersecretary, uh, African American man, the undersecretary in charge of food, Eric Bost. You, you probably know that name. Um, and when the food stamps were reauthorized in 2002, they were actually strengthened. They restored some cuts that Clinton had put in as part of the welfare bill. So this latest situation politically is kind of shocking to everybody. Uh, and I'm sure what you're asking about is a part of the problem, but it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's these sort of um, electeds who uh, no longer have that kind of tradition of bipartisan, bipartisanism in it. You know, back in 1981, when President Reagan tried to take a huge whack at food stamps, Bob Dole was the one who saved it. Uh, so they've really broken something here. Uh, in the last two years. So I wish I could give you a better answer in every respect on that. And back. Uh, it's, it uh, has got in the red states the legislatures uh, in a stranglehold, uh, and that uh, flips over into the uh, districts uh, in the House of Representatives. But over a period of time, the challenge in the 21st century, I, I think, is, is actually something that we should um, feel good about. But people have to do the organizing, they have to do the work, the, the challenge about the messaging, so it isn't just down in the grassroots, it's, it's up there at the top levels of the way we communicate these things. But the raw material is gradually coming to us. Uh, the 20, a way to look at the 2012 election, uh, you do remember, the, the uh, I mean, with the help of Mitt Romney, I must say, since he insulted everybody inside. But the people who came out and voted, that's the 21st century electorate. That, that's the raw material of what I'm talking about. Um, so that's, that's uh, where we should feel like there's some serious possibility. Here it comes. Oh, is there one more? Okay.
I'd say you're all set. Uh, yeah, you know, one, one thing about Robert Kennedy that he said over and over again, most of you know this, uh, but over and over again, he said one person can make a difference. And uh, I really believe that. I really believe that. I, 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 hope, I hope we all do. So the way in which you do it is really the question. Uh, is, is, and there are so many different ways. You know, you can run for office uh, and, and be a person who tells the truth and, and uh, uh, you know, find a place to run where, the, where at least there's a chance that they'll listen to you. Uh, but you can, you can be somebody who uh, is in the nonprofit world, our friend back there, and the kind of work that she, I mean, it, it depends uh, how you, uh, yourself in your own mind uh, consider the next step from what you said because there's so many ways in which you can make a difference in the world I mean just look around uh, Paul Farmer uh, who goes down to Haiti and, and who is just you know done these incredible things uh, in, in the area of health and, and uh, bringing public health to make a difference in the lives of millions of people really uh, so you can pick, you know, you can be a great scientist. You can just go uh, through a list of things. Uh, you're probably a law student. Um, so that gives us some clue as to what you might be thinking about. And, uh, but so we'd have to have a long talk uh, about what you think your, your interests are. And, and, uh, but the bottom line is going to be, there, there, you, you pick an area, and because you are somebody uh, who thinks in, in, in these larger terms, um, and, but also trying to, you know, I'll tell you one other thing. Um, I hope you do have a plan. I didn't. And the, I see a, at least one uh, affirmative response, because uh, most of us are where we are as a result of a set of things that happen kind of accidentally. Uh, but I think it'd be good if you tried to beat that, just understand that the good things that happen might not be the ones that you planned. So thank you, I love that question. And thanks to all of you. What a wonderful, wonderful evening. So great to be here. That wonderful last question and your wonderful last answer reminded me of that young 26-year-old minister who comes to Montgomery from Boston University and somebody just says, would you lead this boycott? And, uh, and then Bobby says in South Africa, every time you stand up, you send a ripple of hope. So, great question and, and, it, and great answer. And it, it reminds me of one other story that I've always read that when Thurgood Marshall was at Howard, that, that Dean Houston said to the class, you're going to get a law degree, do something with it. It'll happen. It'll happen. Um, all of you are in this room tonight, not out of assignment, not out of a directive, but your own personal interest in social justice. And, to hear Peter Edelman say that that's what this university stands for, uh, above all, is that justice is your principal reason for being in law school. It makes us feel proud to be a part of the community that is this university. Uh, two people, though, have to do most of the legwork while I'm with Professor Edelman in the land at our liberal arts campus uh, doing a day and a half teach-in uh, that he has done for us. And those two people are in Donna Zacks Jordan and Jennifer Keanu, who have done probably 100 hours to make this evening possible. So I'd like to ask them to thank Professor Edelman. Um, and they have a presentation formal for Professor Edelman, if you all would like to close the program.
on behalf of the student body. We're just so happy that you came here and, and shared this time with us, and we're, we're really honored to have you. And um, we also wanted to thank you, Professor Bickle, um, for your part in this. So Jennifer, could you? I love to tell you. So we had something for each of you tonight. Professor Bickle, could you please come back up? <laughs> thank you. Yes, um, one, of, one of Jennifer, one of, one of you announced that. Um, we just like to let everyone know that there will be an opportunity uh, to have a book signed. If you don't have your book with you tonight, we actually have them available for purchase. Um, and thank you again, all of you, for being here tonight.